we're going to change gears again, uh, being outside the tank. Uh, this is a, a Harry question, I think. The externally mounted 50 cals that were always on the Shermans. What, what, what was the thing behind those? I mean, you had to get out of the tank to shoot it. Yeah, well, of course, uh, they were put there uh, for anti-aircraft defense, which probably made sense to people who'd never actually had to fight in a tank. <laughs> uh, but but, but uh, veterans I've talked to say that, uh, that generally speaking, uh, they didn't use the thing. They often dismounted it because it would snag on tree limbs and stuff like that when they were driving around. And there is actual uh, documentary evidence that uh, the tankers in Italy and uh, in the Pacific viewed the, the thing as useless. Well, Dr. Porsche came up with a great example of this because he uh, planned uh, and offered to mount a two centimeter flat gun mounted vertically in the uh, mouse <laughs> so that if, <laughs> if the attacking aircraft happened to fly directly <laughs> overhead, <laughs> he, he was nailed. <laughs> didn't didn't uh, get purchased that deal. <laughs> Once he already dropped the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're, we're coming up on the intermission shortly, but we've got a little bit of time left uh, looking randomly through the questions here. Night fighting. Uh, there's much made of the infrared night fighting that the Germans introduced, but then it seems to have vanished from the, from the tanks. Wh what happened? Well, the Germans themselves realized it was worthless. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because the other guys can see you. I mean, they, for many years, every army had been working with infrared. So the minute you switch on your infrared, you can be seen. And uh, they also had the problems that it was very short range. So there was an awful lot of equipment needed to do anything with it. So they established test uh, units. They equipped a lot of Panthers with the fittings for mounting this stuff. But after the first trials with combat units, they realized this was a total waste of space. And all the stuff was stripped out and hidden away. And the Panthers went into battle without their infrared equipment. American tanks uh, featured searchlights uh, in the Korean War. These appeared around 1952, 53. 18 inch diameter incandescent bulb. The bulb uh, glowed after you turned it off so you didn't really get, uh, you were quite a target uh, for others as well. <laughs> the solution ultimately was the Xeon searchlight, a, a Xeon arc searchlight, introduced in uh, around the time of Vietnam, real around 1966, 67. 20, 75 million candle power uh, white light, 25 million candle power infrared. Even with that level of power, you really couldn't get a fighting range of more than about a thousand yards, maybe 1,100 yards or meters uh, with infrared. And of course, by that point, everyone had been using infrared for driving, where it was quite useful actually, and had metascopes or other ways to detect an infrared light on the battlefield. So once again, you're using a very large searchlight to tell everyone where you are. <laughs> you, ever, you ever do a night shoot, Rob? Yeah. We, when we got infrared, we found it, thought, oh, this is going to be fantastic, going to be able to see in the dark and do that. The reality was a lot different. The, the biggest problem, first of all, was sort of as dusk approached, you had to stop, remove the gunner's sight and the commander's sight, stow those, by stowing them, you've lost all calibration on them. Then you had to fit these absolutely awful infrared sights. You then had to try and calibrate those, or bore sight them, before it got too dark. If that worked, and your searchlight worked, um, you then started firing. The, the problem we found was that around about 800 meters, you ended up with nothing but a green blob. And unless it had a light source at the end, conveniently put there by the range staff, um, <laughs> Which, as we all know, the Russian tanks would have had on there illuminating it just so that we could see what was going on. Um, so we fired two or three rounds, and we spent about five hours a night doing that, calibrating, firing a couple of rounds. It was impressive. We doubled with it in many ways. Um, as Ken said, we had tried it with the searchlight off to one side. We sit here with no lights on. You illuminate, and we'll shoot down your beam. We'll be okay. You probably will get knocked out. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> the other thing, the searchlight was a two kilowatt one. It was a fantastic searchlight for playing games with and illuminating into German houses. But as a fighting piece of kit, 
not very good. It did have the advantage that it had an, um, an infrared shutter, so you're actually producing two kilowatt of infrared to help you with your sights. Um, there was no sort of cut-off period. In, we'd go out at night and people say, are we going to fit the infrareds? No. And eventually, <laughs> when you went out on exercise, on the shelves in the troop stores would be the infrared sights for three tanks, and they'd stay there, and they'd only come out for the periodic checks. And <laughs> night fighting really died a death until we started um, getting thermal imager. Of course, you can also use light as a weapon, per se, like your canal defence light things. So what was the thing behind that? Um, absolutely crazy, I would say. <laughs> um, <laughs> it actually goes back, the very first use of an, an idea of using a searchlight to blind people comes up in the First World War with a Royal Naval officer called Oscar de Thorin who ha borrowed a tank off the army and fitted it with a searchlight. You then get a sort of company formed uh, managed by a Greek guy called Metaxas into which a number of people like General Fuller, the Duke of Westminster, people like that put up money. Um, and they ended up with a device which flickered. And it's something like 13 million candle power. It's supposed to blind anyone who looks into it, which it does in, in the darkness. The problem is that it was regarded as such an intensely secret weapon that we never actually dared to use it. In case... <laughs> A few tanks were used as basic searchlights on the Rhine, and I think in India, one of the CDL units there was used during a riot, just to sort of calm people down. I don't know how they did. <laughs> but in combat, it, it was a dead giveaway. It wasn't worth doing. Was, out of it, was that the same Metaxas that made, uh, was named the Metaxas line in North Greece? I doubt it. Oh. I think this guy stayed in England. It was safer. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the secrecy thing, it's not widely known, but the most secret U.S. Army tank of World War II is the CDL. The, the U.S. Army manufactured six battalions worth of CDLs based on the, Brit the British system. They were deployed in the ETO in, in Normandy in the summer of 1944, and as David says, they were considered so secret because it wasn't only that they were considered secret, but there was an agreement between the U.S. Army and the British Army that they would only be used when both sides could agree when they would be used. It was supposed to be a big <laughs> surprise attack, and it's just so difficult to coordinate things like that. And by the autumn of 1944, when there were tank crew shortages, they took those six battalions and converted them. And they end up being the, the U.S. equivalent of Hobart's Funnies. They are used for special mine explosion units and that sort of thing. So if there's ever any kind of strange kit, those six battalions that started out as CDL units were converted to specialist units like mine exploder units. Only four, or, or only two. Four became regular tank battalions. Well, they were, they were intended to go to mine exploder units. They had to stop simply because they didn't have the equipment. The original plan was to convert all six. All right, so uh, uh, you had some? No, no. no all right, I'll, I'll ask a question then before we take our intermission. We're going to go into the realm of close support, how it, or close support tanks with the 75 millimeter and the M8 the 105 maybe in the M4 and possibly the 95 in the British. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the 95 in the British is probably the first one of those to come out, that mix. I don't think there's much in it. it. It's a very strange business that the whole concept of close support in the British Army, in tanks and anyhow, and for the first two years of the war is smoke and only smoke. If you look at the stowage diagrams for a British close support tank, of say 41, 42, like the Crusade or any of those. They've got a three inch howitzer fitted, but the ammunition stowage is something like 95% smoke and a bit of HE just in case you feel you need it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the basic role is to screen your own people against the enemy. So until we introduce the 95 howitzer, we haven't really got a close support weapon. And that doesn't appear until, what, about 43, 44 on the Cromwell and then the Churchills. Um, there's a, a lovely account, actually, of a, um, a troop of crusaders belonging to a headquarters unit and how they all line up and fire their smoke rounds. And you think, well, it's a proper tank. It's a, a real tank with an engine and a crew and a turret and a gun, and all it can do is make smoke. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it seems crazy. If you've got to fire rounds, fire rounds that will hurt the enemy, not just it's make them cough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then you go on, the, you had the M8 was what it was specifically uh, the question was originally posed about. So, I mean, was, was the M8 deemed a success? I mean, how, how, how was it used? 
Well, first you have to consider what it replaced. Uh, it replaced the T-30 assault gun, which was a half-track with a 75-millimeter howitzer, and that meant that crews had to basically point the vehicle at whatever they were going to shoot at, and it was, it was not highly satisfactory. Uh, the M8 sort of has two tracks that are worth considering. One is uh, the actual uh, howitzer motor carriage, and the other is the use of the turret, in essence, uh, on the uh, LVTA-4 uh, uh, in the Pacific, the AM tanks. And it, it, the, the M8 was issued uh, initially to the mechanized cavalry, which by and large was pretty much stuck with it through the war. They figured out how to, to make it uh, useful, and you can see in the after-action reports that they were able to use it effectively. Uh, it, it, they weren't enthusiastic about it, which is one reason they liked having M18s running with the cavalry. Uh, it was also issued to the medium and light tank battalions. Uh, the, the, the battalions that went ashore at Salerno had the M8. Uh, and when they reorganized into the standard tank battalions, that was also the, uh, the officially issued stuff. And some battalions in the Pacific actually used the M8 all the way to Okinawa. But uh, it, was, it was underpowered for what the tank battalions needed. And uh, in Italy, uh, all the battalions got rid of the things and uh, took on the M7 pre-self-propelled howitzer to fill that role. In fact, uh, the 117th Mechanized Cavalry Squadron, when it moved to uh, southern France, uh, it also dropped the uh, M8 and took on the M7 Priest, uh, which I think is the only mechanized cavalry squadron that did that. Uh, so until the, until the, uh, the 105 uh, Sherman came along, basically people were using uh, the M7. There were two battalions in the Pacific, the 767th and 710th, that uh, thought about the problem and concluded we're going to have to destroy a lot of Japanese bunkers. And they actually went with the, uh, the M10 tank destroyer for their assault guns, and apparently that worked out pretty well. Uh, the, um, the AM tank version uh, was, was very effective. Uh, the AM tanks were, were not supposed to spend a lot of time fighting as land tanks, but what, what uh, battalions discovered was uh, for various reasons, they wound up having to continue to fight with ground troops past the beach. And uh, it, it wasn't as good as a, a full-blown uh, Sherman tank, uh, but they found that the howitzer was very effective against Japanese bunkers, uh, which was a, a big thing. Uh, and when the battalions were able to pull back and function as artillery, uh, they, they were the equivalent of, uh, what, like three battalions of, of field artillery. Uh, so uh, overall, I'd say it was successful. Yeah, the Germans, of course, had great success with their uh, close support because the Panzer IV, with the short 75, was a uh, very important part of the Panzer Division. It supported the Panzer Threes. And then the Sturm artillery guys in the, with the Sturmgeschütz had the short-barreled uh, uh, 75. And they were very important until the demand came for more and more anti-tank weapons when they then increased the guns up in uh, caliber, le in length of calibers. And also, um, after that, there's this myth that the, uh, L the L24 short 75 was available and therefore got fitted on various light vehicles, but the demand was there from the units uh, for that close support gun, and it went onto the half tracks and onto the armored cars and so forth. And a, a kind of proof of how the, the troops saw this was that uh, towards the end of 44, they, the order came to dismount the short 75 from the half tracks and to put on pack 40s the big anti-tank gun the l48 but the units were demanding that they get back their l24s for close support uh, of course the, the ultimate close support weapon was the, uh, the stormosa tiger yeah well that was on the uh, that was certainly on the extreme end uh, where you had this 38 centimeter uh, rocket being launched from a tiger uh, but 
it's really interesting to read the after action report from the unit commander that was involved in uh, bombarding the Warsaw Ghetto. He claimed that this was a total waste of money because the weapon was so effective that you as the guy who fired it had to be so far away, unless you wanted to get your own vehicle destroyed, <laughs> <laughs> that he said you don't need to be armoring with 200 millimeter of armor, you might as well have something like a Hummel with just 20 millimeters of armor and bombard from a, a far distance because uh, the uh, blast radius was about 500 meters with one of those uh, <laughs> rounds when it went off. The other problem about the, the, the basically the terrain was unusable thereafter. You, you, couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't drive into this mess. <laughs>